Hello Red Shirts, welcome to another video from Follow Me and Die. I'm your host, Larry Hamilton. In today's video, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the Mastodon social media. What is it? How do I use it? How do I find the people I know from Twitter? I'll have links below for all the relevant information I share. This is a follow-up to a live stream I did from my Twitch channel a couple of weeks ago. Why am I making this video? So far, my Mastodon experience has been very positive. I'm on the Dice.Camp instance, focused on tabletop role-playing games. It has a diverse group of people, and the interaction is positive and uplifting. This is true of what I've seen on the Federated feed. The level of interaction feels a lot like the level of interaction we had back in the G Plus days. G Plus is Google Plus. Some people went to Mastodon when G Plus ended, and I kind of wish maybe I had done that because I've reconnected with people that I've sort of lost touch since G Plus went away, and I've started interacting with a whole bunch of new people. The different views I've been exposed to has been a positive experience. There are all kinds of different people, some that have a similar background and so forth as I do, and then all other kinds of, all over the spectrum. So different ethnicities, genders, orientations, etc. Mastodon does not have an algorithm, so you don't have to game the algorithm to try to get traction to get your content seen. So I've been on Mastodon 16 days, and I like it better than any other social media I have used since G+. I post more on Mastodon than on Twitter in that amount of time, and one reason is that I just get better interaction on ideas on Mastodon. On Twitter, it's just become a favorite or a retweet, not much conversation. But on Mastodon, I get a favorite, which is the same as a like, or a boost, which is like a super retweet, plus the actual back and forth. Most of the time, it's with somebody I've never interacted with before, which that's really cool. So what is Mastodon? Mastodon is a federated social media platform. It is part of what is known as the Fediverse. A federated social media service is one where there are multiple instances, also called servers, that talk to each other to present social media across the Fediverse. We should already be familiar with the federated services that already exist, such as email and telephones. With email, there's different providers, whether you have Comcast, a local ISP, or what have you, whether it's high-speed internet or even dial-up or internet off your cell phone signal. It doesn't matter what email program you use, if you use one provided by your internet provider, if you use a free account from Google. You can send an email from your end to anybody else in the world and they can open and read and respond to your email. Similarly, our telephones. If you still have a rotary dial phone, you can call somebody with a cell phone. If you have a cell phone, you can call somebody with a rotary dial phone. It doesn't matter. It's a federated system, so the different phone companies process the information in a way that the users on each end can work together. That's basically what Mastodon is. Now, since Mastodon is, a, is federated, the instance you pick is going to determine what your experience with the Mastodon social media network is like. So there are instances that are focused on special topics. So history, science, books, politics, role-playing games, art, any topic you can think of. Now, sadly, there are instances that support and promote bigotry and hatred but because Mastodon is a free and open source program, anybody can get the software. And if, as long as they pay for a server to set it up, they can set it up to spew their hate and other nonsense. However, because it's a federated system, there is a great deal of power in the hands of the administrator of each server. So the majority of users 
and administrators, the administrators of most instances will block the instances or the servers that are spewing hate and nonsense. And when one hateful Mastodon instance arises, the admins across the Fediverse will say, hey, this group is really bad. We're blocking them here. And on most instances, it'll show you which servers they're blocking because of being bad actors. Some of them also will preemptively block brand new servers till they get a feel for what they are and what they're about. Each administrator also will publish a list of the rules. And you have to agree to the rules before they let you in. And if you break the rules, they'll just kick you out. Better yet, Mastodon gives power to the user so the user doesn't have to wait for an admin to block an instance full of hateful people. So for example, if you've got two or three people on an instance have content you don't like, while you might block the first two or three at any point, you can say, this is ridiculous, and you can use the option to block the entire instance. So if you think an instance is getting through that's full of hate or other content you don't want to see, you can block it, and while everybody else on your server can see it, you can't, and they can't see your stuff. There are other controls that Mastodon gives the user. There is an option to approve followers, so people request to follow your account, and then they don't follow you until you say, yep, and then they follow you. And there's two benefits of doing that. One, you're vetting your list as you go. So if you don't want to have to deal with chasing out bots after the fact, if you set up this to approve follows, any accounts that are run by bots and the bots have to declare themselves so you, it's not a mystery, you can block them. And if you find somebody that's following you and you go look at their bio and it's spewing some hateful or hurtful or other content you don't want to deal with or they don't appear to show on their bio that they're interested in, say, role-playing games, you don't have to accept their follow. The other benefit of doing that is it gives you another posting option of posting to only those who follow you. So if you have certain topics you want to discuss with a group, but not make it open to everybody, you can do it that way. And as I understand it, some servers will vet the people that sign up for an account. So for example, when I signed up for the Dice.Camp account, I had to wait until I was let in. I don't know if I suspect that it was they checked out my username to see if I had a bad reputation online. At least I hope they did. And then they let me in. Now, I have seen reports that some people of color have had a poor experience with Mastodon. And that seems to be down to the specific instance that they're on. I don't recall offhand which instance they were on that had this trouble. But the quote-unquote problem was that longtime users on that instance were complaining about a person of color sharing their lived experience as a recipient of racism. And those complaining wanted them to put it behind a content warning because they didn't want to deal with it. Well, I have a problem with that. I believe in integrated communities in real life, in the places where we live, and online. This country is made up of a lot of different people. This world is made up of a lot of different people. And we all have a right to be online. And if we have a bad issue that we need to share, we should share it. And the problem with keeping racism hush-hush and in the background is like a lot of things. It builds up and it gets worse. It's better to as Barney Fife would say, nip it in the bud and get it over with. A good example is when my sons were little, I had to tell them, don't lie to me about something because I'll be more upset 
than if you had just told me what the issue was you were afraid I would get upset about. Like they broke a dish or they lost a tool or broke a window or something. Don't wait for me to discover the problem because then I'm going to go figure out, have to figure out what happened, who did it, what's going on, and the consequences are going to be punishment for them. Whereas if they're honest with me, I'm like, oh, darn it, and deal with it. But if they lie about it, then it means I've got to figure out how to deal with it. And family secrets, that stuff is toxic. Racism is the same way. So I've got off a little tangent, but that's my perspective. What instances do I recommend? Well, I recommend that you find an instance targeted to your interests and needs. For example, if you're an artist, there is a popular instance for artists called Mastodon.art. And as I've mentioned for role-playing games, there is Dice.camp. So let's take a quick look here. So here is Mastodon.art. And as you can see, they have 13,000 users. And they've been growing. Here is Dice.camp. And they have almost 4,000 users. And then the biggest instance, the original first Mastodon instance, is Mastodon.social. And they have almost 250,000 users. So just because it's the first and the biggest does not mean better. A smaller instance focused on the thing you're more interested in is probably going to be a better fit. And you can more easily find an instance that works better, do some research before you sign up. And no matter what instance you're on, in addition to being able to block whole servers and block individuals, you can set up a filter to focus on the content from other instances that you want to see. So if you really want to see the content, for example, if you're on the Dice.camp server and you really want to see all the cool art from the art server, you can set up a filter to make sure you see all that. I've got a filter that shows me role-playing game content, and that filters more than I can keep up with. There's a lot of information out there. Now, to help get through the selection process, pair Axbaum on his website here, axbaum.com. He's got a relatively new article called Choose Your Mastodon Instance, and he gives a list of 10 to consider. And he tells a little bit about each. And he also points out that uh, there is the, uh, well, somewhere on here, the uh, big directory of all. So this is the joinmastodon.org, and that lists all the servers. So that's probably a little bit overkill. What I would recommend is if you know somebody who's already on Mastodon that you trust, if they know you and feel that their instance would be a good, safe fit for you, that would be a good choice. Now, if for some reason you feel you've made a bad choice or are have, it's a bad fit on the instance you chose, there is a way to move to a different server instance right here on the Mastodon docs, docs.joinmastodon.org. It, it tells you what to do if you want to move or leave an instance. You can export your information, all your data, including uh, a list of those you follow and your followers. And if you export that list of those you follow and your followers from one instance, you can import it into a new instance so that you don't have to recreate it from scratch. No other social media lets you do that. Those are my recommendations for that. There are no ads on Mastodon. So there's no advertising to clutter the feed or skew an algorithm. You're not having to keep blocking the same advertiser over and over again and see their same ad in awkward places in a thread that throws off your train of thought. How it works is each admin that sets up an instance pays the hosting out of their pocket and they will occasionally ask for funding as the need arises to cover the costs of hosting. And that cost is going to be based on the amount of data, the number of users, how active the users are, 
the volume of traffic it's generating. With the recent influx of Twitter refugees, a lot of instances have had to increase their level of their hosting plan multiple times. As you can see here, in November 18th, there were 700, just over 700,000 Mastodon accounts. Later that day, there was 700, or, or I'm sorry, not 700,000, 7 million. And then there was, so it went from 7,043,000 to 7,014,000 in seven hours. Then on the 21st, they're up to 7,386,000. Today at 1 o'clock, it was 7,591,000. And right now, 7,604,000. And that's it. 6 p.m. They haven't had the 7 p.m. update yet. So that's a lot of growth. Things were kind of laggy there for a while. At one point on the Dice.Camp server, they had over 400 requests waiting. And uh, he had to wait till those cleared the backlog, and then things sped back up, and he's had to boost the plan for the hosting multiple times. I have never had to pay to use social media with actual money. Other social media, they make money off of me just like everybody else with their analytics information, but without ads and an algorithm that helps get eyes on the ads, there's no analytics to sell. So they are not in it to make money. I gave money to help support my instance. The first time I've ever given money to support a social media platform. And I will give more as I can. I mentioned that they have the sign-up page. Here's the sign-up page. You can create an account or you can sign in. It tells a little bit about Mastodon, why to join, why use Mastodon, why this server, server rules, and then the moderated server. It's a long list of blocked servers that you don't have to listen to because they're already blocked. And again, there's the rules so you can see them better. Yes, uh, on the 18th of November, they had 400 new accounts that was slowing things down. So how do I use Mastodon? Well, it is both browser-based and has apps for Android and iOS. And back to Pear Axbaum, he's got 10 quick Mastodon tips, and he talks about good apps. So on iOS, there's Metatext or Toot, and on Android, there's Tusky. I have an Android phone, and I started with the Mastodon official app because I used the Twitter official app, and that did what I wanted, and it looked like the website. Well, not so with the Mastodon official app. You're going to have to go to a third-party app to get a feel more like the browser options. And I do like Tusky. I recommend it. I can't speak to the iOS, but everybody else is saying, yeah, you don't want the official app get Tusky on Android or Metatext or Toot on iOS. And there's people uh, on that can advise you which one works best for iOS. And then he explains the instance concept, why you, uh, oh, if you can't see somebody's full profile, it means it just hasn't propagated across all the instances between your server and theirs on the Fediverse. There's timelines. He's used a graphic from another person about how does your toot, instead of a tweet, they call it a toot, and I assume they call it a toot as a short form of tooth, like a tusk. And depending on how a post you is made and people interact with it, depends on whether or not you see it. And so if you answer no to all these questions, that toot from somebody else will never reach your instance. If there's some interaction with it, it gets some activity on their local server and local timeline and possibly to the federated timeline. And if it gets to federated, then it's possible for it to get be visible to you if it's on another server. I've already talked about controlled posting and privacy, about moving. Unfollow generously. Yeah, if people are 
posting stuff you aren't interested in, unfollow them. No algorithm. I mentioned that. Accessibility. Content warnings. Make sure that if you have some topic that, say you had surgery and you've got a picture or your scar you want to show people, most people don't want to see that. Use your common sense. There's hashtags. There's alt text. So alt text is highly encouraged and some people will call you out if you don't put alt text on images because they want to be inclusive to vision impaired people that rely on screen readers. And hashtags. They recommend that you use what's called camel case. For example, normally you might do all lowercase for digital ethics, but camel case capitalizes the first letter of each word, digital ethics. So you capitalize the D and the E. That helps the screen reader see that it's actually two words instead of a string of letters. If they're all one case, it reads every single letter. Verify your account. I've done that. If we come over to my account, this is what it looks like from somebody finding my page. You see that my blog is green here. Mastodon gives the user power to self-verify. Because I control my blog, I follow the instructions to add a special link to my home page. And it talked back to Mastodon and said, yep, this is the website they said it is, is green. Now, you may see some people, uh, I've got a D6 showing after my name. Some people will have an icon that looks like the Twitter blue check mark. That's all it is. It's the same as this D6. You can put it there. It doesn't mean anything. It, if you see that and think, oh, they're verified. No, they're not. They just figured out how to put the icon next to their name. If they're verified, some of these links down here that they've set up will be green. I even got it to go green on my where to find me for Mastodon, which that was kind of hilarious. I uh, haven't figured out how to do my drive through RPG page, and it's not going to work on Twitter because uh, I, I don't control uh, Twitter. The advanced web interface, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Find your Twitter friends. Yeah, how do you find everybody? Well, there's a couple different ways. There's a search here if you know somebody's handle. So at there's this at username, at domain. You can find them on any place on the Fediverse if their directory has updated and synchronized. If they're on the instance that you're on, boom, you found them. You can search by hashtags as well as a URL for the user or the URL of a post. But searching by user one at a time, if you only have a handful of people that you're looking for, that's not so bad. If you want to try to connect with everybody that you follow or everybody that follows you, there is, I believe, three different services. Yeah, DBirdifier, Fedifinder, and Twitadon. I used Fedifinder, and I really liked how that worked. Basically, what all three of these do is the same thing. You verify that it has permission to access your Twitter account. It looks at, with uh, Fedifinder, you tell it, do you want to get a list of those you follow or those who follow you? And you can do both at the same time. And when it is done, what it does, well, what it does is, is it says, okay, this person is on your Twitter feed. Do they have a Mastodon link in their Twitter feed bio? If they do, it'll add them to the list and it'll present to you a list of everybody and a button that you can click. You click the button, it opens another website, and then you can click the follow button for that user. So again, if you don't have a lot, that's quicker than you having to type it in and search everybody. But there is an option that you can download a CSV file of all those people and then you can import it into your follower list. And when you import it, you want to be careful. If you haven't followed anybody else yet and nobody's followed you, just import it. But if you've followed anybody or anybody's followed you and you want to keep that information, make sure you do the append. Because if you don't append, it wipes out everybody that's there and all you'll have is what's on that CSV file. I didn't have very many 
on my CSV file that weren't already in there, so I ended up adding mine manually, and I go back periodically and see if anybody else has added a Feta Finder, uh, I'm sorry, has added a Mastodon account to their Twitter to see if I can find them. And so that's a handy article here, and I'll add that in the show notes. There's very good information on the Mastodon documentation. So they go through all of this, like what is Mastodon, how to set it up, your preferences, how to run Mastodon, all these different things. So I recommend you go check that out because I've found some very interesting information going and looking there. Now, I also, I earlier mentioned hashtags, so you can search on hashtags and find things. That's, so if there's a topic that you're interested in, do a hashtag search and you'll find it. Down at the bottom here, it has, uh, well, this is my featured hashtags. So if you're on uh, an account, and up here you'll see that I've got a list of hashtags, you'll see which of these hashtags I've posted about the most. And these are specific to me. If we go to the server instance, you'll see the trending now on the whole instance. And so there's a follow Friday, uh, Friday, uh, an FF, uh, they do Catter Day, and uh, the trending now changes throughout the day and from day to day. Uh, other ways to find stuff. You've got different feeds. So uh, you, from here, this is the standard layout when you get in. It talked about the advanced layout, and we'll get to that in a minute. But on the basic layout, you've got the search up here. This gray box here is where the chat box would be when you're signed in. Then there's links down here. Uh, first is the instance and the about profiles, privacy policy for the instance. And then there's Mastodon, about, get the app, that's the official app, keyboard shortcuts, look at the source code, what version the, the instance is running. Then here you see all the different posts in your home feed. So the people you follow and uh, so forth. Hashtags. You can see different hashtags that are being popular. Now this is not signed in. There's news. So this is from the sign-in page for the instance. But similar layout is going to be when you're signed in. Explore, that shows you different hashtags or posts. Local, that is what is on this server, this instance. And federated, that is the content across all of the instances on the Fediverse that your instance accepts. So if it's blocked, you're not gonna, it, it won't be there. So let me bring up my Mastodon account. So as you can see, I've got a different layout here. So let's go to the preferences. And here is the advanced web interface setting. And what it does is it uses more of your screen width and it allows you to configure different columns to see as much information at the same time as you want. Home notifications, federated timeline, and any list or hashtags you want. Uh, there's a slow mode option that they uh, recommend. It slows down the timeline update updates. So as soon as you look at it, it's not scrolling like it'll do on Twitter. This slows it down. Uh, if you want to see animated GIFs, they recommend you turn that on. It's not on by default. You can reduce motion in animations if that bothers you. Disable the swiping motions. Well, that's going to be if you have a tablet or a cell. Use your system's default font. I don't know what that would do, but that would use whatever the operating system's default is. Post layout, uh, crop images in non-expanded posts. So the cropping gets interesting. Uh, discovery, show today's trends. So you can actually turn off that trending if you don't want to see it. Confirmation dialogue controls that. How you want to handle sensitive content and other settings. Save your changes. Then you control your notifications 
and all the usual things you'd expect there. You can opt out of search engines if you don't want to be easily found. Group boosts in your timeline, that means all the boosts would be together instead of spread out. Posting default, so I've got the posting privacy followers only. So because I checked the, uh, well, where is it? So under profile, appearance, require follow requests. Manually control who can follow by approving. And if it's a bot account, you've got to check that. Suggest account to others. Turn that on to make you more discoverable. Then you can fill in your bio. So this is the same header and avatar for my Twitter account. Same dimensions. I just downloaded from Twitter and uploaded here. Boom, it was done. Profile metadata. You don't have to do links and so forth, but I did. And it's got the verification telling you what the link is you've got to do. So whatever information you want down here, you got four things. Anything that's other than these four things, you've got to fit it into your bio. The bio is a little sneaky here. You can drag it bigger. It always shrinks back when you get off this page, but you can tell whatever you want in the bio. I've got mine, I think, as full as it'll get. And then I set what hashtags are featured that I know I'm going to post about quite a bit. So it'll show you all the details on your different followers, how active they are, that sort of thing, whatever their uh, graphic is. Automated post deletion. If you want to, for some reason, clean up old posts, you can check this box, and the default is two weeks. You can change it to whatever you want it to be. And it won't necessarily happen right away because it's a time-intensive operation, so it happens when the server's not too busy. But there's exceptions to the delete, so like there, you can do a pinned post. So once you get signed in for the first time, first thing you want to do is set up your profile. So under profile, as I was talking here, uh, it'll have your display name. If you want to put the icon in here, you can, but that, that would be after you get everything else set up. So do your bio. If you've got a header and an avatar image, do that. If you want to require follow requests, do that. Put in your metadata here. You can do this in any order. Uh, I had this here first, and then I added this to my website. And as soon as I updated my website and refreshed my browser, it was green. So it, it's that fast. If you want to do featured hashtags, you can do those. And then your, your bio. Put in your bio. After you've got your settings on your appearance, your bio, your images, and maybe your featured hashtags, then the first thing you want to do is make an introductory post and you have the option to pin it just like in Twitter you can have one pinned post you can pin it so I, I, it's recommend that you do that so that you don't have to keep introducing yourself to people you will have a pinned post under your bio and let's just go back to here and here and you'll see here's my pinned post right under my bio uh, follows and followers filters I don't have any filters, but you just add a new filter to filter whatever it is you want to filter. We talked a bit about post deletion. You can tell it what you want to keep if you decide to turn on deletion. Your account. Uh, you can change your password. You can set up two-factor authentication, authorized apps, import and exports. You can see how many posts you have, how much media storage is, your follows, your lists, your followers, and any blocks and bookmarks and you can download all of those to a CSV file that you can open in a text editor or a spreadsheet program. You see here there's a search bar but above the search bar that advanced layout has added these other options up here. This is the local timeline which is the same as home which you see here. There's also a link to get to it there. This globe is the federated timeline. You've got a link to get to it there. Then direct messages, you can do direct messages to people by doing at username. They are private in that no one else is going to see them within the application, but they are not encrypted. So it's recommended if you do a direct message that you not put anything in there that you wouldn't want anybody else to know. You can do bookmarks. A bookmark is going to be a post that you have bookmarked for later review. A favorite, that's just a star. 
we see here this person favorited a post. That's a notification that somebody liked something I did. Then there is uh, favorites. We talked about that, excuse me, lists. So what lists, uh, just like in Twitter, it makes a list of accounts that you want to have their own feed. For example, I made a list for artists. And I'll see all, I've got artists and I can see all the activity of the artists. Because I have to approve follow requests, I've got an option for follow requests. I don't have any now, but if I did, I would have a list here and I would click to approve them. I can also get to preferences down here. There's a menu option here, a, a settings button for this section. And you can show boosts or not, show replies or not. You can even unpin it and move it around. You can use these buttons to move it around. I guess it's expired. We had some server messages announcing what was going on with the server up here. I guess they must have expired. Once you read it, it it's less visible up here. Uh, notifications, there's a check mark. See how this is blue? I hit the check mark, the blue goes away. I'm caught up in notifications. There's another control panel. There's all these options to control that. This does not have that left and right arrow, but as you saw when I moved another column, this switched places with it. This is my explore or the special things I'm following. And so I've got all these hashtags related to role-playing games. So if I turn it to local only, I would greatly reduce the volume, but then I might miss something that was cool. Similarly, it will update and looks like I'm all caught up at the moment. It's no problem to disable that, save your changes, go back. And one little check mark changes it. So if you want a simpler look, don't check that. So I like seeing all the different things on one screen so I can take care of it quicker. With the one column of information to interact with, that's more similar to what the cell phone app is like. We kind of touched on it. Best practices for posting, you want to use hashtags. That helps people find the information in question. So if it's about role-playing games, you want to do hashtag TTRPG or TTRPGS or RPG or RPGS. If it's a specific one, you probably want to do like hashtag D&D, hashtag Savage Worlds or whatever game it is. There's alt text for images. So let's pick on me. And so here I've got in my introductory post these hashtags. And here's the post where I gave a teaser about this that I'm working on right now. And as you can see, if I hover over it, we'll see the alt text. So we're going to do a post here. You notice there's a 500 character limit. Twitter's 240. Some instances give you a really huge limit, but I think the most common is 500. And 500 is a good size. You can do follow on posts, but when you post, you can just say, hey, this is a post. You can do polls, maximum four characters and set how long you want it to last. It can be up five minutes to a week. You can add attachments. So here's that graphic. Let's just bring that in. No description added and you can mark, I could mark it as sensitive. This doesn't show what it would look like. So we can add our description. You've got 1500 characters, three times as much text on a description. This little icon here, I've got the default because I've got, uh, I have to approve followers. I can do followers only post and that's my default. And I could change that default to always be public. I'm going to leave it on followers only so that I'm always interacting. Or you can do mentioned people. And on mentioned people, if you don't put a name on there, you're the only one that can see it. That's a little trick I discovered. Followers only, okay. Unlisted, visible for everybody, but it's not auto-discover. Public means it's 
put out there easily found. So it's recommended if you're going to do a thread, make the first post public and then make each additional post unlisted because everybody already got a notification about your lead off to the thread and you don't need to keep bombarding them with the same topic. If they're interested, they can follow the whole thread from your first topic. And threads aren't near as long unless you have some long-winded thing you're talking about. Content warning. Say uh, there's a couple different things I've noticed people do. Some do spoiler TV show, whatever the TV show name is. Hashtags would need to be in a spoiler, the content warning. Because anything down here is going to be hidden by the content warning screen. It doesn't get indexed by hashtag, so you'll need the hashtag up here. You can control your language. I've got mine set to English. Uh, if you are multilingual and post in more than one language, change this to whatever language you're posting in. I'm going to change this to mention people only so that we can see what this is going to look like with a content warning. And I didn't add a description. Let's add a description. If I could type, that would help. All right. And then we'll publish that. Go here. There. So TV show, spoiler, show more. It's hidden whatever's behind here. We can show more to see the text, and if we want to see the picture, we can hit sensitive content and see that, and then it pops up the alt text that I typed in. And then I can star it, bookmark it, boost it, or reply to it. Now, a boost, that is like a super retweet. It works like a retweet, but it does more. It's better than a retweet. A boost means, hey, this is boosted. Get this out here so other people can see this cool idea. So you don't need to amass a huge following and try to game the system of the algorithm to get people to get eyes on what you're posting. You post what people want to see and they'll start boosting it so that more people see it. And I've had some posts get multiple boosts back to back. The interaction really picks up and that's a good way that we'll add followers. People say, oh, that's really cool. I want to know more about what this guy's posting or this gal or whoever, and they'll follow. There's another handy little option. They have a mute conversation. So if you don't want to see any more about it, you can, of course, delete it. You can bookmark it on the menu and so, as, in addition to this icon. And... There's this delete and redraft. Let me just click on that. And they'll say, are you sure you want to delete the post and redraft it? Favorites and boosts will be lost and replies to the original post will be orphaned. So that used to be the only option. If you had a, a grievous typo or misinformation you had to correct, you'd lose all your interaction. So if you don't want to lose all the interaction, there's now an edit. So the most recent update that came out last week added the option to edit. So you can hit edit and it pops it back over into the same thing, shows you what your original was. You can make whatever your change is, save changes, and you've preserved all the likes and boosts and replies. Whereas if you would do a delete and redraft, it's much like the edit. Pops over here like that. But when you publish, the original is deleted. So very similar, but not the same. And let me refresh and I'm going to delete it. There. So as I mentioned, Mastodon doesn't have ads. So how does it keep running? The administrator has to pay for it to start with. And as they attract users, users step up and offer to assist with the costs. They'll indicate what the, at least on the Dice.camp instance, he's indicated what the current hosting level is, how much it costs, how much money is in the bank from donations, and how long, how many months 
it will cover things. If everybody on a server would give five bucks, that'd probably be enough money to cover a year. If you can't afford it, don't give. By all means, keep using it. Those of us that can afford it will give. If you want to change to instances, I mentioned that. There is a process to do that. You want to make sure you get all your data out of there and then you get rid of your account on the old instance and then you go sign in on it up for a new instance. What if your instance goes away? Well, there's a procedure that if a server administrator decides they don't want to keep administering their instance anymore and they can't find anybody to take it on, there's a procedure where they disconnect their server from the Fediverse. They send a command so that the rest of the Fediverse knows they're going away. And what that does is, is it enables users after you have downloaded your follow list of followers and list of who you followed and all your other data, get your new account on another instance, you can upload your list of who you follow and who follows you and pick up from there. Now, there are no guarantees, so if there's some guy running a instance out of his house and he's a loner and drops dead of a heart attack, there's nothing you can do about that. So there's no guarantees, so you can download your data as often as you want. Just like Twitter is not guaranteed. Look what happened. Elon Musk stepped in and started doing whatever who knows his motivations for what he's doing. It doesn't make any sense to me. He's been there like a month and it's terrible. Google Plus went away. It's gone forever. It's not even like MySpace where you've got a much reduced and broken implementation still running out there. But just like everything, there's no guarantee. So do your research, do your due diligence, help out administrator or if you can afford donations or time or whatever above all vet the instance you're going to go to make sure it is focused on your interests and will meet your needs i think the best piece of advice is if you know somebody on mastodon and trust them ask them about the instance they're on if they think it's a good one for you and if they do then sign up for that one otherwise I would say from what I've seen, the art instance I mentioned, and I'll have a link in the show notes. If you're an artist, that's the one to go for. So mastodon.art. If you're into role-playing games, the one I'm on, dice.camp, that seems to be very well run and things are running well in my opinion. I've not seen signs of any problems. I look forward to seeing you over on Mastodon. You can find me at follow me and die at dice.camp. I hope I see you on the Fediverse. We can share some information. And above all, have a great day. And as always, game on.